Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, despite the rain, we're ready to go. Uh, I don't know, you could have picked any, any day in the last month and I could have said exactly the same thing. So, um, welcome to this special event this evening uh, featuring Janusz, I've got to get, to get it right, Janusz Onyszkiewicz. Uh, all right, okay. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful, or we are very grateful to the Australian Institute of Polish Affairs for bringing Janusz here and also to allow us to have him speak to you. Uh, we've, over the years, we've done a few events, haven't we, Mark? It's been a long time now. I'm not going to say any more at this point, and I'm going to invite uh, Mark Berda, who from the Institute, to introduce our guest. So, Mark, over to you. My name is Mark Burdajewicz. Burda is shortened mm -hmm. for those who have problems with the food. filling the cup. The first president of AIPA, professor of sociology at ANU, Jerzy Zubrzycki, known as uh, father of the Australian uh, multiculturalist, uh, and uh, was, of course, the best choice. We, we couldn't have a better patron for years to come. Um, several others were our presidents, and amongst them Professor Martin Krieger, certainly known to you um, or to many of you. He was unfortunately unable to come today. He sent his apologies. AIPA adopted three strategic objectives to develop and foster close relations between Australia and Poland, to build and maintain harmonious relations with, with communities that have historical ties to Poland, and to disseminate in Australian media information regarding Poland. I should also mention that AIPA is totally, totally independent, relying only on finances raised through membership fees, not aligned to any party or organization. The main strategy chosen by AIPA was bringing to Australia the top Polish politicians, economists, writers, and public intellectuals, representing all political movements and organizations, economic, cultural, all okay. other religious, secular. There is no limitation to to field which we uh, were presenting. Our guests uh, gave public lectures, participated in symposia, and met members of Australian political and media elites. Such visits invariably generated positive publicity, publications, and media appearances. Now to our guest. Mr. Onyszkiewicz was born in Lwów, that time in Poland, now in Ukraine, called Lviv. He graduated in 1959 in mathematics from Warsaw University. After graduation, he worked in the Polish Academy of Sciences, published, and in 1967, he obtained his PhD. Parallel to his professional activities, he was very much involved in the political opposition to the communist regime and was involved with the establishment of the Solidarity Movement. In 1981, he was nominated as a spokesperson of Solidarity. After introduction of the martial law, he was arrested and interned for more than a year. After fall of communism in 1989, he was elected member of parliament. Soon after, in the spring of 1980, he was nominated first civilian 
vice minister in the communist dominated Ministry of Defense. This government lasted not long. Uh, later on, Mr. Onyszkiewicz was Minister of Defense in the cabinet of Anna Skotska and again in the cabinet of Jerzy Buzek. Politically, Mr. Onyszkiewicz was leaning to Democratic Union and Freedom Union. At present, he is a member of Democratic Party, which is continuation of the Democratic Union. In June 2014, he was elected to the European Parliament and soon after, in July 2004, he was elected Vice President of the European Parliament. Mr. Onyszkiewicz has been monitoring elections in Ukraine, Egypt, and Georgia on behalf of the US-based National Democracy Institute. Presently, Mr. Onyszkiewicz is Chairman of the International Center of Democratic Transition, a non-for-profit organization based in Budapest. This center collects the experience of recent democratic transitions and shares them with those who are following the same path. The center strives to show how dozens of young democracies have made and, make and are making the transitions so that those who set off on the difficult journey from dictatorship to democracy may learn well from the successes as well from the failures. To conclude, I cannot restrain myself to say a word regard other passion of Mr. Onishkevich, mountaineering, or Himalayism, how is that called specifically? Himalayas in Europe and in Asia. He was several first, he has several firsts in Hindu Kush in Himalaya. In 1976, his party tried to conquer K2 the second highest mountains in the world after Mount Everest. K2 has the reputation of being the most difficult and dangerous mountain. I read today in Wikipedia that uh, 300 people were able to reach the top of K2, and one third of those was killed in the attempt. Is that correct? Yeah, more or less. <laughs> more or less. Mr. Onyszkiewicz's party reached the height of 7,670 meters, less than 1,000 meters to the top, but had to return in the horrendous, horrendous conditions without any major injury. By experts, this was considered really exceptional. And I welcome Mr. Onyszkiewicz. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank you for inviting me, for giving me an opportunity to tell you about certain things which we consider important, and I'm very glad that you also feel that the issues which are important in our part of the world are of certain interest to you as well. And let me start with the year 1898. That was the end of Cold War and end of the division of Europe, which was the result of Yalta Agreement and the outcome of the Second World War. Uh, communism collapsed, first in Poland, then in other countries, in Central and Eastern Europe, finally also in Soviet Union. Uh, but the situation was not c quite clear, because after such a dramatic, terif terrific change, usually, what would one would expect is to uh, an emergence of a new international order. And there was an attempt to set up a new international order, and certain agreement was signed following what has been agreed before in Helsinki in 1973, an agreement known as Charter Paris for a New Europe, in which several important declarations were made and certain important commitments were made First, all parties, including all Soviet Union at that time, and then later on, all countries which emerged from Soviet Union, commitments to such values like, like settling disputes by peaceful means, like freedom of states to choose their own security arrangements, like human rights and fundamental freedoms, 
reframe the use of force against territorial integrity and so on and so on. But clearly, the situation was still quite unsettled. And uh, that could be seen easily also by what was happening in, in Russia or in Soviet Union when there was a coup attempted by hardliners, by conservative forces under the leadership of the Vice President Yanayev, coup which was supposed to topple Gorbachev and to restore to the Soviet Union traditions and political practices. That created a situation that Poland, which was sandwiched between Soviet Union, later on Russia on one side, and the Euro European Union on the other side, was in a very unstable situation. <clears throat> to be a country in sort of a gray zone, obviously, is not something very, very, very easy and very comfortable. The reason why to be in a gray zone is, is so, so uncomfortable is that Usually, a country which is sort of sandwiched between two major political entities uh, is an area where the, these two entities are trying to comp compete. And what worried us uh, was, first of all, that first, you know, we could be an object uh, of, certain, of certain ambitions on the side of Russia. Poland was absolutely determined to join the European integrating institutions, first of all, European Union, which was set up and changed its nature after 89, partly to, well, to put it quite frankly, to harness the new Our first feeling was to join the European Union. We signed the agreement on association with the European Union in 1990, but it became quite clear that the path towards full membership, if successful at all, could be very lengthy. And in fact, it was lengthy because we joined the European Union only 13 years later, and in totally different political uh, circumstances. So the clear choice at that time was to join NATO. And that's why we were, were so keen to join NATO, because we wanted to be absolutely sure that Russia will have no ambitions. And to illustrate our way of thinking, I think well, it probably would be better to tell you a joke which you may know. This is a joke about a certain person who was schizophrenic. He thought that he is a mouse. So he went to a psychiatrist, he was treated, he was released as cured person, and he returned in absolute panic. And the, the, the psychiatrist asks, why are you panicking? What, what's happening? And he says, well, doctor, there is a cat sitting there. Well, but you know that you are not a mouse. I do, but does she? <laughs> so, you know, our aim was that the cat would know, once we are in NATO, that we are not a mouse. So finally, we embarked on the path towards NATO membership. But all these developments obviously uh, did not clarify the relations with Russia. To know Russia is something extremely ambitious and is very difficult. Uh, Russians themselves say that Russia cannot be understood. Russia cannot be measured by the same yardstick as other countries. Russia is something which could only be believed in. 
And Churchill said once also that Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. <laughs> Uh, but nevertheless, let's try to understand what was the development of the situation in Russia after this terrific change of 1990, of 89 and 99. Well, after a period of turmoil and uncertainty, usually attributed to Boris Yeltsin's presidency, one could hope that Russia will gradually get less mysterious and ominous and will become a more predictable country a country which in its behavior both on the internal and international arena as well as in an adopted system of values will be getting closer to the countries of the democratic West. This hope was clearly demonstrated by the concept of one common space from Vancouver to Vladivostok as well as an agreement on cooperation between the European Union and Russia with a vast catalog of areas of close cooperation, such as economy, social issues, as well as security and foreign policy. Some very prominent political personalities proposed imminent admission of Russia to NATO. On the other hand, European Union was seen by Russia as the essential partner, which together with Russia could form a counterweight for the United States as well as for China and other emerging powers in Asia. This hope was based on the conviction that to be successful in competition with the US, the European Union will have to rely on cooperation with Russia, taking into account the alleged fact that EU has more common interests with Russia than with the US. This could be seen especially, but not exclusively, in the area of economy, where competition with the US is especially strong, and on the other hand, the Russian and the EU economies are fully complementary. The opinion that economic cooperation between Russia and the EU was highly attractive to the EU uh, and was enhanced by the feeling that the Russian economy is in a very good shape. Gone were the memories of the perturbation of the year 1998, when Russia had to declare insolvency, the ruble had to be drastically devalued, and the real income per capita dropped 30%. In 2006, the Russian opinion making centers, uh, the reigning feeling was that under Vladimir Putin's rule, Russia will soon become one of the leading industrial powers. The ruble will be one of the world currencies, and Moscow will be one of financial world centers. However, the year 2008 was a cold shower. In the beginning, it looked like Russia will sail through the turbulent waters of the financial market crisis quite well. Soon, it became clear that Russia will be very seriously affected, and the GDP's fall in is the biggest in G20. The hopes for a steady and fast economic development withered away. Gone was a conviction on an achieving in a not very distant future a place among the leading industrial world powers. To make things worse, what followed did not inspire an optimism. Despite high prices of oil and gas, the Russian economy demonstrated all the features of permanent stagnation. The informal deal Putin made with Russian society, I shall secure permanent and quick, quick growth of your standards of living, but you will not interfere with my ruling, ruling, running the country, looks fragile uh, and susceptible to the repetition of the Ukrainian political crisis. To avert such a threat, the only opinion, the only option was to mobilize Russian society around some other attractive grand idea, restitution of Russia as once again a great and strong country, widely feared and respected in the world. In that context, year 2008 brought to Russia a new important experience. The war with Georgia showed quite convincingly the reluctance of the West to confront Russia 
and respond with harsh measures. On the contrary, it looked like the West was ready to acquiesce in Russian practice of waging a preventive war, as it was seen in Abkhazia, and to another practice of extracting of pieces of the country's territories and tying them closely, also politically, to Russia. The policy of reset was naturally construed by Russia as a proof of the Western willingness to carry on relations with Russia on business as usual basis. However, it became clear that Russia will not be able to restore its greatness by acquiring a special status in relations both with the EU and NATO, which for Russia should mean the ability not only contributing but also blocking basic political, economic or defense projects. Therefore, Russia could no longer hope to become one of the world power centers resulting from such special relations with the EU and the U.S. Russian ambitions, this was almost a slap in the face to hear that Russia is only a regional power. Therefore, some other program would have to be developed to get up from the knees and return to the world stage as one of the key global partners. Additionally, if you can no longer secure a popular support by material enrichment, the only remaining option is the program of restoration of Russian political or military greatness. Since Russia thinks that she cannot be the key player in the Euro-Atlantic galaxy, it is quite natural that she tries to create another solar system in which Russia will be at the center and which would be strong enough to matter gravely in the world. It is also important to formulate an ideological framework for such a new construct. Looking at what kind of a state Putin wants Russia to be and what should be the place and role of Russia in 21st century, it is impossible not to have a feeling of a déjà vu, an impression that what we see is a return to ideas characterizing Russia and her political system under the Tsarist regime. The foundation of this system was formulated almost 200 years ago by Uvarov, who listed three basic features, autocracy, orthodoxy, and nationalism. The historical mission of Russia was not only to gather all Slavonic lands, but also to protect orthodox religion wherever and whoever, and by whoever it was practiced. Autocracy meant a total domination of the state embodied by the Tsar. What made any grassroots activity illegal and reforms could come only at the Tsar's initiative. According to this view, Russia was the only genuine political and ideological heir of Byzantium and a depository of its traditional values as well as the only true version of Christianity, since the orthodoxy was based solely on faith and not affected and distorted by Western rationalism. Therefore, Russia, a bastion of the only authentic civilization based on lasting values, not, and this is a quote, riddled by debauchery of thoughts and shameless knowledge, as described by Stepan Shaviryov, and not incapacitated by the legal constraints as Western civilization has a historical mission not only to protect this civilization, but also, or first of all, to strive to spread it by all means, including uh, an imperial policy. Looking at present Russian policy, it is not difficult to find a lot of analogies with the Tsarist period. In a concept of a direct, directed democracy and a steady, rather rapid concentration of power, elimination of institutions of a civic society, and full control of the judiciary and the press, the electronic one in particular, one can find a great similarity with the Tsarist concept of autocracy. There are, of course, differences. Paraphrasing an old saying that old Prussia was not a state that had an army, but an army that had a state, one can say that Russia is not a state that has a secret services, 
but secret services that have the state. To illustrate this, let us quote a well-known sociologist from the Russian Academy of Science, Olga Krishchanovska, who wrote that 77 to 78% of the political Russian elite has strong connections with secret services. Returning the analogies, the Orthodox Church is again treated as an instrument of state policy. The Church is instrumental in reconstituting bonds between all Orthodox believers and in creation of a myth of a Russian world, a world of another non-European civilization based on traditional values which were abandoned or forgotten by the West, a world Russia must protect and unify. For some more radical ideologists, like Alexander Bovdanov from Moscow State University, Russia is in a fundamental civilizational conflict with the West, and Russia should, uh, in, and that's a quote, aim at the destroying the West in its current form as a civilization, end of the quote. So Russia is back at its imperial trail. Accordingly, the political narrative has changed, as has been noticed by, for example, Alexei Arbatov, who wrote, and this is the quote, the world imperialism has lost its negative connotation in Russian public discourse, and now is increasingly often given a heroic resonance. The process of gathering the Russian world does not need to be carried out solely by outright annexation, as in, in the case of Crimea. It can be done by forcing or luring countries or peoples to join a basic political structure, such as the newly formed Euro-Asiatic Euro Union, in which Russia will obviously have a dominating position. This AU is going to be, if not an outright embodiment of the Russian world, then it will be its natural and its indispensable extension, giving it a need, give it, it a needed depth and strength and espousing different than European, more authentic civilization. President Putin said that Eurasian Union is a project to preserve the national identities of member state, states and to safeguard the historical Euro-Asiatic space in a new century and in a new world. Eurasian Union is a chance for the whole post-Soviet space to become an independent center of global development." End of the quote. is nothing else but a dialect of Russian. Therefore, it is absolutely central to new imperial Russian policy to block any Ukrainian aspirations to get closer to Europe and to tie it finally and irrevocably to Russia. The question arises to what extent Russia will be bound, constrained, by international norms. Well, Russia, in its imperial trail, uh, is not going to be bound by anything. I spoke once with one leading Russian political analyst, and I asked him um, what kind of rule, international rules, Russia feels that Russia can break without any problems. And he said, Russia will break 
any rules as long as he can get away with it. And this is the problem, and this is not something absolutely new. Let me quote Kissinger, who wrote some time ago, empires have no interest in operating within an international system. They aspire to be the international system. So that's the situation, you know, the Russia is at present. But is Russia really such a formidable uh, problem? Well, certainly Russia is. And Russia is such this problem because of its military might and also of its military doctrine. I don't want to go to, to the detail, but let me only tell you that not very long time ago, Russian head chief of the general staff, Valery Gerasimov, wrote a, a very important piece uh, this describing what are the Russian views on the modern warfare. And what he wrote was this. First, there will be no distinction between war and peace. Wars will not be, will not be declared. Everything will be waived. Personal in uniform will not, will not be sort of remixed with personal in, in cover. Potential of changing even a stable country into an area of an intense internal conflict using minorities, political opponents, using a protest potential of people, etc., will be sent to the youth. There will be no major clashes between military units, but ex ex extensive use of special forces and using also internal opposition to create an open conflict on the whole territory. That was tested in Crimea, we, we, we know that very well. So the Russian view of the modern warfare uh, reflects the views which were raised some time ago by another Russian military theorist, Nelson, who in the middle of the 30s, last century, created a, a concept of a mutinous war, war based on internal mutiny. So now Russians will not concentrate on clash of major armies, but on total destruction of, this, of the public of the state, changing every state into kind of a chaos and this way winning, uh, winning uh, the, fi the final war. Is Russia you know, so, so powerful? Well, Russians are now in a very special situation because Russians raise also the issue of self-determination. That's what they mean when they try to justify the annexation of Crimea. But at the same time, you know, Russia is in a situation which is described by this known English saying, don't throw stones in you live when you live in a house of glass. Well, because Russians very often are in a minority under their own territory. Let me give you some quotes which are based on the official Russian censor. For example, well, in Dagestan, which is northern Caucasus, there are only 3.6% of Russians. In Ingushetia, there are 0.8% of Russia, less than 1%. In North Ossetia, it's 20%. Uh, in Siberia, well, in Tuva, there is only 16% of Russians. In Saha, which is uh, you know, northern part of Siberia, only about 38%. Uh, in Tatarstan, very center of Russia, with tremendous oil deposits, 37% are Russian. So, they obviously will have a problem. How they are going to, to, to solve this problem, uh, how they are going to solve the problem between Russia and China regarding the Far East, is something very, very open. But still, Russians are dreaming about recreating of the concept of concert of big powers. For them, the model is the Vienna Conference. When the big powers came together, they set an international order which was kept for quite some time. Well, and for them, the idea is to have a concert of three big powers, US, Russia, and China. Well, unfortunately, you can find a similar concept also in, also in the United States. 
So this is something which is very worrying, especially for minor countries, because according to Russian thinking, what this concept of big powers is, is about, big powers decide what is going to happen, and then everybody will sort of be will be obliged to somehow control the smaller partners to obey and to accept this order which was imposed by the, from above. What is really striking is the absence of the European Union in this consideration. This is clearly the result of a certain crisis which we have in the European Union. Crisis which I hope will not go on. The European Union will return as a major economic power. Obviously, the European Union will never be a major military power because it is not a super state. But nevertheless, the European Union will certainly play an important role on, on the world stage. And this way, I hope that what Mao Zedong once said to a journalist from the West asking what are the views in China on the developments in Europe, if he said looking at this journalist with certain you know, air of, of superiority, um, he said that, you see, in China, we are not that much concerned about what is going on on this, in the, on, on, on this unimportant peninsula. <laughs> so, so I hope that it will not be uh, repeated in future, but nevertheless, we have a certain lesson to, 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 to learn from the past and make our, our own uh, house in order. Well, thanks a lot. Sorry for, for speaking too long, but... Type of questions. There is a mic, so if, if you like to ask a question, we'll just get a mic to you so we can catch or capture it. So, really, it's over to you. Yes, down here. Looking at Russia from the EU perspective, it looks like various different EU countries have various different relationships with Russia depending on, obviously, how much they need its energy supplies, but a whole load of other things. From the European perspective, then, how much do you think Europe as a whole will work together to form policy towards Russia? Or how successful do you think Russia will be in picking it off and creating various different interest groups? Well, this, this, this is a very serious question indeed. So far, European Union kept certain, certain cohesion. Uh, imposing sanctions on Russia and extending the duration of these sanctions because sanctions are imposed for half a year. They are not imposed indefinitely uh, with possible lifting these sanctions. They are imposed for a very precise period of time, six months. So far, you know, the extension of these sanctions was not a problem, but will that go on, and how long will that go on? Well, this is obviously a question. Russians think that they will manage to steer the internal problems within the European Union to that extent that this unanimity and extension of sanctions requires unanimity will collapse. I do hope that the outcome of the elections well, so far we have good outcome in, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, well, that the outcome will be equally good in France. Uh, by good outcome, I mean not allowing the, the Le Pen uh, and this radical uh, right-wing uh, French party uh, to, 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 to get the presidency and majority. And the same in, in Germany. Uh, as far so well, well, we don't know. We don't know. Obviously, Putin also doesn't know, although he believes that he may actually get this result. Uh, as far as our dependence in European Union, or in some countries, on Russia's supply uh, of of oil and, and gas uh, is concerned, it is true that in some countries like Latvia, like like uh, 
Estonia, uh, like Bulgaria, like Slovenia, Slovakia, sorry, they depend 100% on Russian supply of gas. Oil is easier. Oil is easy. Gas is difficult because gas is distributed by pipelines. Uh, but the European Union invested a lot of money to build interconnectors. So now we can get the, the, the gas also from the other side, from Asiatic, uh, LNG gas, and so on. So our dependence on Russian oil and gas will be reduced to that extent that Russia will not be able to keep us at ransom, at least some countries at ransom, which may reduce the, the Russian the Russian leverage over the European Union. Uh, so I would say, well, we shall see. I do hope, and I will keep my fingers crossed, that European unity, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, will be preserved, and that the European unity in supporting Ukraine will be preserved. Because Ukraine is really absolutely essential. As I try to, 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 to indicate uh, you know, in my presentation, the problem between Russia and Ukraine is first psychological. You know, for Russians to accept the existence of Ukraine as independent state, state and the acceptance of Ukrainians as independent nation is extremely difficult psychologically. Because if you know this is accepted, then Russia is not the hair of Kievan Rus. It's a country which emerged in 14th century, somewhere in the midst of forests. In, in, on Central European plain, and that's it. And the relation of Russia to Kievan Rus is powerful, extremely powerful, militarily, organizationally, civilizationally, of Kievan Rus. The relation of Russia to this country is something like the relation of United States to Southern England. After all, United States somehow emerged with mean, the American nation from the British. But you know, that's it. So, for Russians, it is extremely difficult. And there is also another problem. And this is known for, from, for about 100 years. You know, it has been repeated by many political thinkers, also by Brzezinski, that if Russia will dominate Ukraine, will form some kind of a, uh, you know, political entity with Ukraine, then Russia will be far more tempted to, to challenge the others and to, 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 to enter the path of imperial policy. Russia, without Ukraine, could be prosperous, powerful, respected, but sort of regional non-imperial power. So the irony of the situation is that you know, to keep Ukraine as independent state is also extremely important for the future of Russia, if by, if by future of Russia we mean future of democratic and non-imperial Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, most uh, uh, elucidating tour. My question is. Um, interested in your views on the economic model that Russia is following or not following in the, um, in the development of its um, resources and its economy. And uh, the question is sort of motivated by two observations. One, that Russia has probably the, you know, the, the, uh, the most richly endowed uh, country in the world in natural resources, but has been um, uh, observedly
Eu acho que é isso, isso, isso é uma influencing country. You know, the, if you look at Russian economy, if you look at Russian exports, you will see that Russia exports basically only you know, raw materials. It's gas, oil, diamonds, nickel. Uh, well, have you ever seen Russian products uh, in a shop here or in Europe or in Japan? Well, nothing. Russia is totally Russian. Economic policy is absolutely dominated by their production of gas and oil. And this is the trouble because the, dep the oil deposits are now getting more and more already uh, exhausted. The new deposits they have, they are very difficult to get because they are in northern parts of Siberia. They would require tremendous investments, which Russia cannot have because they simply have no, no money and no technology. So it looks like Russian economy is stagnating. And this stagnation has been seen, as I already mentioned in, in my presentation, since quite some time. That was something which prompted Putin to change totally its sort of dialogue with the society. So it looks like Russian, Russian economy you know, will stagnate and without inflow of capital and technology, Russia will not modernize. There was already a, 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 a program to Russia to modernize Russia. This was pioneered by Germany, and Russia simply refused to, to actually to accept this program. Russia knows that Russia cannot get the technology on probably even not the capital from China. But China is, for Russia, another big problem. It's, not, it's, it's a problem of political nature and economic nature. I don't know if you, if you, if you realize that if you look at the, at the, uh, the, 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 the how Russians positioned their military might along the Russian, uh, on Russian territory, you will see that Russia have foreign four military districts. One which is on the west, which is more or less east of west of west of Urals, to Polish border. On the south, which is more or less bordering uh, Caucasus, uh, than some other Asian countries and and, 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 and Ukraine. The central, which is more or less central Siberia, and eastern part. The 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 the, the, the concentration of Combat-ready troops is the, the largest in western and southern districts. But as far as the potential capacity to develop and to deploy the troops, the, the strongest, even stronger than west in western districts, is eastern districts. And the Russians are every couple of years organizing major military exercises, which are, they, they call west, east. The last one was under the scenario that Russia was invaded by South Korea and Japan. But obviously, no, everybody knows what they really have in mind. Because in every such exercise, they, they, they practice transfer of about 150,000 troops to the east. So, you know, China is for them clearly a big problem. And China is for them a tremendously big problem for other reasons. One reason is also economic reason. The far e east, Russian far east, is very scarcely populated. There are about 5 million people living there, and across the border there are 120 million Chinese. Uh, well, and the number of people living in the eastern part of, of, of Russia is diminishing, not only because of tremendous di demographical problems, because Russia, Russians are dying out. You know, they, they are losing about half a million of people every year. But because people in the East are migrating back to central Russia. So this is the problem. Nobody really knows how many Chinese are already in Russian, you know, Far East. Uh, but these territories are known, and Chinese do remember, that they lost these territories as a result of, as the Chinese say, unequal treaties in the middle of the 18th century, of 19th century. 
they do remember that, and even Mao Zedong already raised the issue, uh, or, but he said that we will sort it out in a peaceful manner. But the problem with, 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 with which, which Russians may have is that they are probably economically not able really to keep these areas, and they may lose these areas the same way they lost Alaska and Boston, North Carolina, in, in the United States, and, and so, and on on top of all the problems, the, and to, to, to just just to show you how what is sort of the mechanism of certain infiltration of Chinese to the Far East, uh, let me remind you that in Russia, you know, they have except the problem with democracy, with, with sort of Russians uh, are, are, are dying out, uh, which makes the percentage of non-Russian population in the Republic growing faster, because Muslims obviously have large families, Russians have very small families. But the, 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 the demographical factor is that for every 10 uh, women in the age around 35, there are only about 7 men. This is, this is the situation. The, the, in China, it's the reverse, the reverse situation because of one, 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 one child policy. And, you know, if you look at Russian statistics and Russian opinion polls, Russian women would love to have Chinese husbands. They work, they don't drink, they bring the money, and they are available. You know, they are Russian. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, Russia really potentially has a tremendous problem in the, in the Far East. Russia obviously tries to patch it up somehow by having good relations with China, but Russia is not selling more sophisticated weapons to China. No. They are selling them, if they sell more sophisticated weapons, they sell just single sort of uh, planes or tanks, but not the technology. So, you know, this is the problem. And the problem, sorry for diverting from, from, from what you raised, but I simply wanted to, to tell you that Russia will have tremendous problems with the economy, which simply cannot sort of sustain the, the development of the country, especially in, in contrast with what is happening in China. Um, thank you, Minister Rushkesh. Such a fascinating talk, and it's so tempting to get into so many <laughs> subjects the Russian women and the Chinese men. <laughs> we haven't even talked about President Trump and, you know, the way of waging war of destabilizing countries. Such fascinating topics, but I have to confess I'm drawn back to the beginning of your talk, the country in the gray zone. Um, you know, my father was from near Lvov, was a hundred years ago. This was not Poland. This was um, Austria-Hungary. Um, and then it was communist USSR for a while. And so they're very contested lands. And so I wanted to come back to Poland if I could, because especially since you have experienced yourself and been a player in the emergence of Poland and its geopolitical move towards NATO and the European Union, I'm just fascinated and have to ask you about Poland's current thinking and prospects and what you would advise, well, Poland, from your eagle's eye view, perhaps, um, in, in a context where Europe seems to, frankly, be in distress, you said in crisis, um, is on its eastern flank, Turkey is, you know, very strongly uh, agitating Europe now, Brexit, you, you know, Europe seems to have passed its peak and is in an existential crisis, and Poland is seems to be contributing to it somehow, especially, you know, recently with the election of the president of the, of the European Council, and Poland seems to be undermining Europe in some ways, or there's an ethos. I mean, this country, in which, you know, we share the heritage, has been a historical battleground for Europe, anyway. Armies back and forth. It's an indefensible country. There's planes, and easy for <laughs> tanks to go through. What should Poland do? I mean, it, it seems to be schizophrenic to me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm worried. 
Well, the trouble is that, <laughs> you know, what I think Poland should do is not what Poland is doing. <laughs> because, you know, now we have in Poland a certain, I think, profoundly wrong policy and view what should be the role of Poland. Uh, and the view is based on an idea that Poland should somehow concentrate the countries from Baltic Sea stretching south to Adriatic and to Black Sea, the countries which uh, joined the European Union and NATO after the collapse of communism, and form a certain block of countries like-minded, like-minded with sort of certain common heritage, uh, and having this kind of understanding between themselves assuming that Poland will be the leader of the whole group, uh, clearly, then, you know, these countries would be able really to confront the major power, the major players in European Union and in NATO, but first of all in European Union. Uh, so I think that this is something extremely wrong. I think that the whole mess that Poland, uh, you know, can actually form this kind of block of, of, of several Eastern European countries uh, is something which is, which is absolutely unrealistic. Uh, not a long time ago we had in our association, the Euro Atlantic Association, which I also chair in Warsaw, we had a, a German ambassador and introducing him uh, before he delivered his some speech, I said that Poland and Germany have many things in common but have also certain things which make our countries differ, different. And one difference which is easily seen is that in European Union, Germany is a country which is expected everybody to be the leader, but it wants to be the leader, doesn't want to be a leader. And Poland is a country which wants to be a leader, but can't be. And, you know, this because, you know, there, there, there is in other countries, in our part of the world, in our part of Europe, there is no sort of feeling that, you know, they should really form uh, some kind of a block to confront any, anybody, especially Germany, obviously. So I think that, honestly, you know, with, with this tendency in, in Poland, uh, which I think I, I deplore, uh, I think that our really hope is not in a Europe which will be sort of formed by centrifugal forces, but which will be more united and which will be able, really, to form common, also maybe common security, maybe the, not defense policy, but at least security policy. And because we should remember that we had problems with Russia, for example, with export of our meats, of our meat and our agricultural products. The, you know, had we been left to discuss with Russia, we wouldn't go very far. But we managed to create, a, to be in a situation when it was not Polish-Russian matter, it was European Union-Russian matter. And that changed the, the whole framework. That changed completely our sort of negotiating position. Uh, the same is with China. If we would like to fight Chinese sort of flood of cheap products, you know, or or, 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 or Chinese, uh, you know, negligence as far as as, 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 as patent rights and other rights are concerned, we would be at loss. The only hope for us is to, to be part, I would say, influential part of much larger entity, and that's what we what, what we what, what we can be. But un unfortunately, you know, the, our, our present policy is going in, in a total different direction, which, as I said, I deplore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Minister, um, can we talk about the, the elephant in the room, the possibility of uh, some sort of understanding between the new administration in Washington and the existing administration in Moscow, which could lead perhaps to some understanding that Moscow would retain some sort of hegemony or control over its own territory, 
which is what you uh, alluded to earlier, in a sort of non-aggression uh, way, um, which Uh, which Trump may actually follow. Uh, but what one can say is first that for Trump, I think uh, China obviously is the main problem. Uh, this, and it is also the main problem from the military point of view. If you look at Trump's decisions, how to spend the money which he is going to allocate. For, for military purposes, you will see that he wants to replenish the stocks, which are quite natural, and which were exhausted as a result of various military companies uh, you know, U.S. had in the past. But it will go to develop American Navy and Marines. These are not sources which are of any importance on European theater. They are important in the Pacific. They are important here, in this area. So it looks like Trump, uh, his main sort of concept will be how really to contain China. Uh, how far he is going to go, nobody knows. Uh, uh, but this is the problem also for us, because what may be the, the, the result of his concentration on China is a certain neglect. Uh, as far uh, uh, as Europe is concerned. But what is, I would say, a good, uh, good augur, a good, good sort of side of his policy is who was selected by him after some problems uh, as, for example, Minister of Defense. Uh, you know, he is really somebody who, who is very serious about Europe. He's, he's he is very serious about Russia. So, uh, if you look at what actually is United States is doing, United States is complicated, complicating sort of economic fabric of of, of, of the world trade by renouncing TPP, by saying that you know the agreement with Europe is is. Well, on the back burner, if not in a decrease, uh, and that's, that that could be the problem. Uh, but so it is very difficult to say. There is one thing, however, which really makes me, regardless of what Trump is, is saying and, and doing, uh, and this is that American policy. If you look at American policy since for the last. Not since uh, President Wilson, but even before, there was always a very strong element of certain. Uh, 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 this element was was a system of values. American American policy uh, was not fully driven by values, but you know the values were present there. They were present there somehow. An American involvement, for example, in defending Europe twice, basically, was to 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 certain extent driven by these commitments. Uh, this is not the case with Trump. Trump is a businessman. He simply would like to negotiate everything, and he will treat international relations, unfortunately, as a situation in which there is a zero sum 
sort of dream. It's a win-lose situation, not win-win situation. And this, I think, is, is probably the main problem with Trump. Otherwise, we will see what is going to happen. But it looks like Trump is somehow already restrained in his free wheeling, sort of political dealing, by a quite strong um, sort of American establishment in, in, in think tanks, uh, in Washington, despite his despite for the elites. The elites are sort of making some sort of influence on, on Trump, and let's hope that at least you know, Trump will be kept well, on, on, on rails, <laughs> and not will sort of be, be, be a very destructive force. I'd like to ask you, to what extent do we have possibility, the concern about militant Islam, does that give us opportunities for West and Russia uh, to somehow work together? Well, I think that clearly we can work together with Russia on, on confronting the, the militant Islam. But the problem is that some people think that, you know, Russia will do us a certain favor working with us you know, on, on confronting militant, militant, militant Islam. It is not so. Russia is much more interested in fighting ISIS than we are in Europe and also, the, you know, the Americans are in, in, in the United States. After all, Russia has a tremendous number of Muslims. In, well, in Chechnya, in fact, Russia does not control Chechnya. You know, this is the, the, the region north of Caucasus. Uh, Russia waged two wars to control Chechnya, and now uh, Russians think that they won the Second War. They did not. Chechnya is already practically independent. The ruler of Chechnya is Kadyrov, who is a, who is a hitman for, for, for Putin. Uh, there is practically Sharia in this area. The, 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 Federal law doesn't apply in the, in the area, uh, but at least he's loyal to, to Moscow. But in other areas, you do not have this kind of policy. And you have the same situation in Central Asia. In Tajikistan, for example, the, the fight with ISIS is extremely strong, and Tajikistan, Russia, wants to keep in sort of its own uh, 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 sphere of influence. So, Russia is much more interested in fighting ISIS uh, than, than we are, and including uh, Americans. There is only one element which probably makes us different than Russia. Russia would like to keep fighting ISIS, but not winning. And why? Because Russia claims that it is better to have our Russian... Uh, Russian... Mm, the, well, not Russian, ethnic Russians, but are Russian Muslims fighting in Syria than fighting in Russia. It's easier to kill them in Syria for, for various reasons than try to do the same with them in Russia. So this is probably the only thing. But the, the, what, what it boils down to, it boils down to the following thing that clearly we have common interests with Russia, but Russians should not be rewarded in any sense, in any other area, for cooperation with us in the Middle East. independent study and, and for all of us here this evening it's been an absolutely fascinating uh, talk. Uh, here in Australia many of us, including me, have uh, Polish blood in our veins <laughs> and uh, many more of us understand just how important uh, Poland is uh, in the sense that you are at the front line with Russia. So. We really wanted to hear. I was very pleased for you to tell me at the beginning that you're an optimist, 
<laughs> because I think <laughs> it's a commodity in scarce supply, but very necessary, especially when you look at the outlook. And you've painted a very fascinating, complex uh, picture, but you've illuminated it for us. So thank you very much, and we hope you'll come back again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.